you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. <clears throat> and he went out about the, the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. <clears throat> and about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So, then ev so when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto the children, unto his stewards, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. When they came that were hired <clears throat> about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. When they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong, didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for your goodness to us, your grace and your mercy. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful to you. And Lord, would you please draw us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we've been talking about being a disciple, and we've been talking about discipleship. And, and listen, this thing of being a disciple, being a follower of Christ, uh, I believe America very much could be on the verge of, uh, of learning what that really means. It's, it's following Jesus, as we said a few weeks back. It's, it's not about keeping the rules. It's uh, what defines our life is our relationship with Christ and following Him. Look, the Pharisees of all people, they kept the rules during Jesus' day. And uh, when, the, when they got good at those rules, they'd make up some more rules. And boy, they kept those rules. But they were not followers of Christ. They were critics of Christ. <clears throat> so just following the rules, keeping the rules, that's not all what it is in, in being a, a disciple. It's about that personal relationship, and it's about following Him. Following Jesus is a lot about investing our life in others. Uh, remember that word to follow can mean two things. It means to imitate, much like follow the leader. So if I'm a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, then one thing I need to be striving to do is to imitate him. And what did he do? He went about doing good. He was constantly investing in the lives of those that he came across. So if I want to be a disciple, I want to be a follower of Christ, that's one of the things I need to be doing. <coughs> Pardon me. It also means to obey him. If I want to be a follower of Christ, I need to follow his command. So when I'm thinking of being a disciple, a follower of Christ, a couple of questions I can ask myself, or one question I can ask myself, is who am I investing into? Who am I pouring my life into? Who am I pouring the gospel into? Who am I pouring Christ into? Look, being a Christian is not about sitting to the side, refraining from doing bad. That's not all there is in being a Christian. Being a Christian has nothing to do with just separating yourself and say, okay, look, I'm not doing bad, so I'm a Christian. No, a Christian, being a Christian is an active thing. It's a thing of action. 
uh, Jesus was out and about amongst the people, not just refraining from doing bad, but he was doing good. He was ministering to the people. When he saw a need, he met the need. Let me say, both of those that were his followers and those that were not his followers, he was meeting their needs. He was ministering. So when we think of being a disciple, something you can think of is think investment and think eternity. Uh, you know the song, I only have one life and that will soon be passed. I want my life to account for Christ. What's done for Him will last. Lord, send me anywhere. Only go with me. Lay any burden on me. Only sustain me. Sever any tie, save the tie that binds me to the home. Our attitude about salvation will greatly affect our attitude toward our service for God. Now think about that statement for just a moment. My attitude toward my salvation will greatly affect my attitude about my service for God. If I have the attitude, well, hey, hey, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, and that's it. Well, then that's going to be my service. If I have a casual attitude about salvation, I will have a casual attitude about service. But boy, if I'm very passionate, and if I'm in awe of my salvation, I read one of the older preachers uh, uh, today, I was reading something, and he said this, those who would say church is boring are those who are not in awe. See, if I'm in awe of Christ, then it doesn't matter how monotone the speaker is if he is speaking of Christ. And it doesn't matter the quality of the singer if they're singing of Christ. If I'm in awe, I can find joy in that. I told you before about a man uh, uh, that uh, he had been a, uh, a drunk, I believe, Mr. Sidney Suggs, and Man, any time he'd, he'd sing up in the choir, and he didn't have the greatest voice, but he'd sing up in the choir, and any time the song mentioned the name Jesus, man, that guy would just break down to cry. He was in awe. <clears throat> so my attitude about salvation will greatly affect my attitude toward our service for God. Now look, Paul said, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him, which is your what? Reasonable service. Now, Paul was beaten with rods. He was stoned, drug outside the city, left for dead. He was imprisoned. He was beaten with whips. He was scourged. He uh, suffered uh, shipwreck a night and a day. He floated around in the ocean. And here's what Paul said about all that. Oh, that's just reasonable. Paul, how, how could you endure those things? Paul, what are you going to do now? You've just been stoned and left for dead, and, and your body's bruised, and, and your body is broken. What are you going to do now? Well, I'm going to go preach in the next city. Paul, don't you know you're in jeopardy? Yeah, why would you do it, Paul? After all that Christ has done for me, that's just reasonable. Paul went this far. He said, all those things that I counted gain, I count them as loss. I was listening to a preacher who had gone over to, I believe it was India, and he was preaching to a large group of uh, 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 Christians that had been persecuted. They, I mean, they had gone through it. <clears throat> His cab driver was one of those Christians that was attending the meeting, and, and um, he said to the to the cab driver, he said, you know, everybody here, all these Christians here, they seem to be so intense. Where are your casual Christians? The cab driver thought about it for a moment. He said, that doesn't make sense to us. He said, to think of a casual Christian, that doesn't make sense because we have given up everything to follow Christ. We've given up our families. Our, our families have thrown us out on the streets. They've disowned us. We've been in prison. We've been beaten. We've given up everything, and to think that we would give up everything to be casual about it. He said, that doesn't make sense to us. See, they so value their salvation. 
and they're so in awe of their salvation that they're so grateful to serve. And they're so pumped up about serving. Paul called it reasonable service. Um, Listen to this in Acts chapter 5, verses 40 through 42. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them. So here's some apostles now. They've been, they've been captured. Uh, Gamaliel says, look, don't kill them. If this is of God, we don't want to fight against it. If it's not of God, it'll fizzle out. And it says, they, to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They said, wow, man, you mean Christ suffered for us and we've been counted worthy? We've been given the honor of suffering shame for him. Wow, this is is tremendous. What an honor, what a privilege. Why were they so dedicated to their service? Because they were in so awe of their salvation. Why were they such uh, 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 committed disciples, committed followers? Because they were in awe of their salvation. Now look at the next verse, verse 42 in Acts chapter 5. Listen to what it says. They had been beaten. They went back. They were rejoicing that we've been counted uh, worthy to suffer shame. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Salvation should always result in service. This should be a natural thing. If I'm really in awe of my Savior and in awe of my salvation, isn't that going to motivate me to serve Him more? Anybody out there? Okay, there's a few out there. Ladies, if the men won't say amen, maybe you'll need to do it for them. It should always result in service. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 15 here. By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. This is Paul speaking. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Those other disciples, they had been called, some of them from some rough life. Matthew, he was a publican, and and, uh, uh, they were detested. Uh, Some were fishermen, rough cut fishermen that would curse and one even denied, Peter denied Christ three times. And, and here's Paul, though. He was responsible for imprisoning Christians. He was responsible for some of them's deaths. And yet God, in His incredible grace, saved Paul. And Paul said, look, Because of what God did to me, Paul viewed himself as the chief of sinners. He said, I I was the chief of sinners, and yet God loved me. And so what did that spur him to do? He said, I labored more abundantly than them all. See, my attitude towards my salvation will directly impact my attitude towards serving. You show me somebody who's really not too much into service, I'll show you somebody that really doesn't appreciate their salvation. It's taken for granted. We, we don't want to serve others, and it's all about ourselves, and we become so selfish. And I, I mean, my goodness, we can be pulling into Walmart and getting ready to pull in. Hey, there's a spot up front. Oh, the Lord, did, look what the Lord did for me. Gave me an empty spot up front. And right as we're about to pull in, somebody comes the other way and jets right in there. And all of a sudden, our attitude goes from praise the Lord to what's wrong with people? My goodness, idiot. Didn't they see me turning in? Didn't they see my turn signal? Don't they see this hand gesture? Instead of just saying, you know what, bless bless her heart. She's 80-something years old. And that was a handicapped spot. And I don't have a handicapped thing or hanging on my mirror. Bless her heart. You go ahead. Yesterday, yesterday I was in Goldsboro. I ran by somebody giving me a gift card to Chick-fil-A. So I went by. Oh, man, I'm going to eat some healthy food here. I got one of their 
rat. What's it called? Uh, some kind of rat. Yeah, chicken pool rat. Some avocado lime ranch stuff to dip it in. I'm going to splurge a little bit. I'm going to get some a meal. So I got the French fries with it, and I ate those. Then I saw the sign that said Pete's Milkshake, and it all fell apart. But I was standing in line, and there's this elderly lady standing kind of beside me. I wasn't really in front of her. She was in front of me. But she is talking to somebody, and, and she finished talking, and she turned around and said, Ma'am, go right ahead. She said, No, 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 you were in line before me. I said, Ma'am, you go right ahead. My mama would whoop me if I didn't let you go ahead of me. And she said, You know it. When I meet a young man like you, as nice as you are, I always figure they have a mama or a grandma somewhere. right and I have a savior amen he labored more abundantly now let's get on into this passage because what I've just said there's kind of review it's, it's not even having to do with this passage here here we have some men this, this fellow who owns a vineyard he goes out and he's in the morning time he, he agrees with these men he said hey if you'll come work in my field today I'll, or my vineyard I'll pay you a penny at the end of the day well now we wouldn't do that would we work for a penny. It meant more back then than it does now. If you'll work for me today, I'll give you this penny. And they said, okay. A few hours later, he thought, boy, you know, I need some more workers. So he goes back. And he says, hey, fellas, why aren't you working? He said, well, because we're waiting on our, our check, our unemployment check to start working. You know, you know, I won't be able to get it. No, they didn't say that. They said, well, nobody will hire us. And so he said, well, come work for me. I'll pay you at the end of the day. The next few hours later, he goes back and says, boy, I need some more. And there's it's getting near the end of the day now. And he says, fellas, why aren't y'all working? We, nobody's hired us yet. Well, come work for me, and, and I'll hire you. In the evening, it came time to reckon the wages. Remember, he had told those that was working all day, I'll give you a penny. He gets the ones that have just worked a few hours, and he gives them all a penny. And so these at the end that have been working all day, they go, oh, man, this guy is generous. If he gave them a penny, and they've only worked a few hours, can you imagine what he's going to give us? Hey, we worked three times as long. I mean, he, he must be going to give us three pennies. Man, this is great. The next ones came, and he gave them a penny. And those who had worked all day came up, and they held their hand out, and he gave them a penny. Now, wait a minute. Did he do anything wrong in doing that? that that's what they had agreed on. But all of a sudden, they get this attitude, well, well this isn't fair. Well, it was fair, wasn't it? He just happened to be merciful and kind. But with these, he gave them exactly what they agreed on, and yet they began to complain. Let me first say this. God is always fair, folks, when it comes to compensation, okay? He is always fair. God's grace and God's goodness is always equal or greater than anyone who serves him. Listen to this in Proverbs eleven eighteen. The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. <clears throat> Many times we do what we do because of what we might get, don't we? I mean, be honest, we do. Now, I've heard stories about in the old days, people would do things for other, others and didn't expect a thing out of it. But boy, nowadays, I mean, my son Trent, I asked my son Carson one time, I said, uh, will you work for me? Will you, will you, you want to come help me work? He said, sure. He said, uh, how much did he offer you at first, a dollar an hour? He said, uh, at the end of the day, he said, how about I, I pay you a dollar an hour? And Carson said, how about 20 bucks on the day? <laughs> where would brotherly love go? Out the window, man. Isn't that right? $20? Didn't he say $20? Isn't that right? Oh, $2 an hour. But you ended up getting 20 bucks for the day, right? He's a, he drives a, a hard bargain, man. But we, we look at, well, what can I get out of this? Let, let me say something, folks. If we would stop thinking of what can I get out of this and just think of what is right and leave it in God's hand, do we really think God's going to do us dirty? Do we really think that God's going to rip us off? No. 
I, I, I don't believe so. James 4, 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore God, say, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Listen, the more grace I need, God will give it. He's always fair. He's always just. Paul went to the Lord. And, and much like, I guess, these, these men in the beginning of the day here, he went to the Lord, said, Lord, three times he said, Lord, I've got this thorn in the flesh. Whatever it was, would you remove this from me? No. But Lord, I'm serving you. This is these men in the beginning said, we've borne the heat of the day. Paul could have said, Lord, I've borne persecution. Look, look at the, see these stripes on my back? Those are, are because of you. I, I've been standing for you. And see these bruises on my body and see how some of these bones have been broken and weren't set properly and how things are all whoppy jaw. Do you see this scar over here? That's from serving you. Here's what God said, Paul. I'm giving you my grace. And my grace is sufficient for you. Listen to Hebrews eleven twenty six, speaking of Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Recompense means the payment. In other words, he, he said, I would, I, I think being reproached for Christ is a greater thing. It's of more value than all the riches of Egypt. Why that? Why, why do you think that? Because I know I'll be rewarded one day. I know I will. I know I have a just God. I know I have a, 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 a fair God. Our job description, our, our mission is kind of a, a vague one as children of God, as followers of Christ. You know what we're to be? Servants. That word paints a broad stroke right there, folks. Just as Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to serve, who did he serve? He served the leper, the deaf, the blind brokenhearted, the lonely, the hungry, the thirsty, the publicans, the sinners, the lady taken in adultery, all these people, he served them. Where did he serve? Out on the hillside, down by the sea, in the publican's house, in the Pharisee's house, in the synagogue in the temple. Our job description is this right here, to serve. And listen, we don't need to worry about, well, well how's God going to reward me? Just know, He will. He'll do it in His time and in His way. It might be on the other side of eternity. But boy, what a blessing that'll be, won't it? What rewards that'll be when we open our eyes and see him face to face. And can you imagine anything greater than hearing our Savior say, well done. Whew. You know, growing up, I was a normal teenage boy. If my parents ever gave me a few bucks, I was thrilled about that. But nothing thrilled me as much and my mom said it all the time. My mom was always talking me up. Oh, you could do anything. You put your mind to it. You could be president one day. And I'm thinking maybe I could. And uh, you could do anything. And oh, you're you're the you're the greatest, man. Dad was quiet. And to get any words out of him sometimes was an amazing thing. He's a quiet man. But whenever he said these words, you did a good job. Man, I knew it had to be something. What a reward to hear him say, good job. And yet sometimes, don't we serve God sometimes because of what we feel like we may get? 
well, you know, things are getting tight. Well, I better make sure to tithe so God will bless me. Well, are we tithing just so God will bless us? Are we tithing because he loves us? He chooses to bless us fine or he chooses not to. Well, you, oh boy, you know, I've got a big decision coming up. I better go to church. Well, honey, shouldn't we be going anyway? Oh, I'm, I'm having family problems. I, I better read my Bible because I want God to bless me. Do you see what I'm saying there? Those men, as they worked, they said, well, I'm working for this, this money. And when they saw, well, they got more. I want more. And then they complained when they didn't get it. Well, much the same way. Let me tell you some things about complaining. Number one, it displeases God. You realize that? Numbers 14, 26 through 28, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Here's what they were saying. Boy, the Lord's brought us out to die in the wilderness. Here's what he said. I've heard them complaining. You tell them that what they've said, that's what's going to happen. I, I'm tired of it. There, there were times where, uh, one time where he said, Moses, I, I'm tired of it. I'm t- come up out from among the people. I'm going to kill them over and start over with you. Moses, this man of God, he falls down before God and said, no, please don't do that, God. Remember your promises. You, please don't do that. Have mercy on me. Complaining displeases God. Complaining damages relationships. How many of you love spending time with someone that complains? How many of you spend time with someone? Don't know. Don't raise your hand. Spouses start looking at each other. We don't like to spend time with people that complain. It ruins relationships. Listen to this verse here. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. To minister God's favor to the hearers. We, our, our conversation, our behavior, rather than complaining and pointing out all the negatives, let's let our speech be that that introduces Christ and shows the spirit of Christ to people that edifies people. Complaining destroys a thankful heart. You know, as uh, uh, when we complain, we're focusing on the problem. That which we consider to be bad, and by the way, every problem is not necessarily bad. God allows some of those problems to come into our life for our good. But when we complain, we focus on the problem, that which we consider bad, and we take our focus off of the goodness and faithfulness of God. One man said this, I complained that I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. I was talking to a guy who was in a, a competition recently, and during the competition, he said, and it was a, there were wounded warriors there uh, uh, at that competition, and uh, the guy, he, they had been doing a lot of leg work, and he said, boy, my legs are hurt, and he looked up and he saw a veteran with no legs. And he said, immediately, I shut up, and said, I will never complain about my legs being sore again. Charles Wesley said this, as long as a man is alive and out of hell, he cannot have any cause to complain. How many of you are alive tonight? Say amen. Amen. How many of you are not in hell? Say amen. Okay, those that didn't say amen, I, I might want to. You might want to scoot over a little from them. He says, as long as you're alive and out of hell, you don't have a reason to complain. We have so much. We sing that song. So much to thank Him for. Complaining. Now listen to this. Is expressing displeasure. At God's blessing. Now, this passage I read that, that, that wasn't really the intent of this scripture, but it pictures this, these people's attitudes. Picture this right here: <clears throat> they had been blessed in having a job, period, and they had to agreed upon negotiation. They agreed, okay, we will work for this amount of money. 
And then when they got there and got that amount of money, instead of saying, thank you for the job and for the payment we agreed on, they began to play their, not play, they began to complain. And what they're doing is expressing displeasure with the blessing they had been given. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always, now listen to this, for all things, not, oh, that, something just happened, not just in all things, but for all things, unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what God said here, uh, and Nove- uh, November, good man. In Numbers 14, 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? He said, I've showed them all these signs. I've brought them out and I've told them I'm leading them to the promised land. And they complain about the manna. They complain about the lack of water. They complain about not having enough meat. They complain, and then they say, I've just brought them out here to die. He said, when will they believe me? When we complain, we're doing the same thing the children of Israel did, and we're basically saying, we're not pleased with the blessings you've given us, and we don't trust you. Woodrow Kroll said this, ultimately, all our complaints are directed against God. Now think about that and let that sink in. All of our complaints are directed against God. Yesterday, I was in a complaining mood. Anybody ever get into a complaining mood? I was talking to my wife, and and I'd say, well, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and... (laughs) And then I, 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 I did something else and said, oh, there's an all good night. There's something else wrong. It actually got humorous to myself. Oh, boy, I'm being ridiculous. Instead of stopping to think, you know what? God sure has blessed me. Let my eyes get on what I thought were bad things. They weren't really bad things. They were just wrong. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Now listen to this challenge here. Do all things. Now, how many things is all things? I I think that's about all of them. Do all things without murmurings and disputing. Boy, try that. Try living that tomorrow. Hey, tell you what, just try living that tonight. Do all things without murmurings and disputing that ye may be blameless and harmless the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. You hear that? He says, now listen, you want to do everything without murmurings and disputings because you are supposed to be shining as a light in the midst of this crooked, perverse people. You can't do that if you're murmuring and disputing. When we complain, It gives people reason to doubt the goodness and the grace of God. God is still looking for servants who will be committed and invest their lives into the work of the kingdom and just trust Him for the outcome. Yesterday, I I get on Facebook once in a while. If you ever send me a message, it may take me three days to return the, the, to reply, but I went on there and Michael Warren Pastor Warren, my brother Warren's son, he posted on there, for all of you who post all your problems on Facebook, you are a walking billboard for how dissatisfied you are with God or something like that. It's like, how? Just click the like button? That's a, that's a way of saying amen on Facebook. Let me ask you, are you a walking billboard for the faithfulness of God? Are you a walking billboard that declares the faithlessness of God? Let's be followers of Jesus. Let's let our attitudes, our demeanors, our life reflect the goodness of God around us. Let's pray. Father, we, we love you.